Hey everybody, Jay Hersko here with the Agile Uprising. We're giving you a bit of a different episode this week. For those of you who are not aware, Mike Beadle, uh, original Agile Manifesto signer, creator of Enterprise Scrum, passed away suddenly on Friday, March 23rd. We are all deeply saddened by this. And as a result, we wanted to rebroadcast our initial interview with Mike when we did the Agile Manifesto Signers podcast series. That actually was the start of Agile Uprising. So we're bringing you this episode again as a tribute to Mike. All of us are deeply saddened by this news. And I think it goes without saying that the Agile community lost one of its great minds and his loss will be felt by all. If you are interested in contributing to his family, there has been a GoFundMe page set up to help them. Uh, Mike leaves behind a wife and three young children. Please visit the agileuprising.com for a link uh, to the Beatle family GoFundMe page. Uh, once again, sincerest condolences to Mike's family. And please enjoy our rebroadcast of the initial interview we did with Mike when we discussed the signing of the Agile Manifesto. This is the Agile Uprising Podcast. Hello and welcome. Today we are jumping into the next step in the Agile Manifesto author review. Today we are very lucky to be joined with um, joined with uh, Mike Beadle. Uh, I am going to be co-hosting today. This is Ryan Lockard, and along with me from the Agile Uprising is James Gifford. So first and foremost, Mike, welcome aboard. Thank you, guys. Cool. Um, so, Mike, we, we've done this conversation a few times with a bunch of your um, your cohorts, your colleagues, however, however you guys, the fraternity, however you guys want to frame yourselves. Um, and it's, it's been enlightening. It's, it's helping to set the context for the folks that are unaware of the events prior to the Agile Manifesto, the event itself. Um, and it helps, I think, really do a, it makes an attempt at building a time capsule of information that otherwise I don't think is available. So to get us started, um, for anyone that's not familiar with Mike Beadle and your professional life prior to 2001, can you just help set some context? What were you doing? What were you, what was your domain? What areas of interest did you have? Um, that, that type of thing. What was your professional space prior to the Agile Manifesto event? Sure. I, um, I was trained as a physicist uh, in 1987 or so. Uh, I was completing a master's and then a PhD in physics. And so I came into software development when the uh, object-oriented world was just taking off. In fact, I went to some of the early object-oriented conferences thinking this was the, the, the way that uh, the industry was going to go. And uh, I found myself in the room with uh, people like Ken Beck and Ward Cunningham and Grady Bush uh, and eventually Jeff Sutherland. And so these are the same people, per se, that wrote the manifesto. But uh, I got a job at IBM uh, in uh, 1987 or so. And uh, IBM kept calling me because I was, uh, I guess, the only person that they knew that knew object-oriented stuff back then mm -hmm. and uh, eventually made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I, I did not want to, per se, be a computer person. I was a physicist, and I was invited to, to, to work at IBM uh, basically under duress, uh, meaning that they were paying me too much money and it would be stupid not to join them, you know. And so, uh, so that's, that's the way I came into the industry. Uh, over from 1987 through about 1995, I was in a record number of failing projects. Maybe they didn't call them failed projects, but uh, we had, you know, very many projects that were years late, not months, years, wow. two, three years late. And they had run budget overruns in some cases, close to a billion dollars, you know. I mean, uh, it, it was really, uh, to me, was almost uh, uh, unfathomable, if you will, that we even finished these projects in some cases. I was in a few abandoned projects. And just to give you the, the, the context, I, I had joined uh, a number of companies in their efforts, including uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, American Airlines, mm -hmm. uh, 
IBM and then uh, later William Mercer. And I was very frustrated. So I was, I, I had joined the, the software development industry. Uh, after 1995, after I found Scrum, I spent five years uh, doing Scrum before we went up to write the Agile Manifesto. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was like a miracle drug kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it, um, we had a project that was nearly three years late with a $50 million budget that had been failing. And we say that project, when I, uh, when I compare the productivity ratios of what we were doing before Scrum and after that, after Scrum, it was a few thousand percent, close to 10,000 percent, actually, productivity improvement. Don't be too impressed because, they, you know, when your productivity is zero, <laughs> anything looks like infinity, right? I mean, and so, so that's, that's uh, after 1995, I started doing Scrum. I was very active in uh, the conference space. I, I used to be a conference organizer and a workshop organizer at the conferences, especially from the perspective of organizational patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, I joined, uh, made really good friends with Jim Copeland and Jeff Sutherland, and we would basically run around organizing uh, organizational patterns conferences. Right around that time, I became more uh, interested in management patterns. And so I wrote a pattern language for, for organizational design, if you will. And so I, uh, I started doing more management consulting right around 1996, 1997, and so, uh, so I came from that background, you know, large scale enterprise development and then management consulting. Uh, and uh, even in 1997, I had done a Scrum project that was out of, uh, you know, out of software, non-software uh, Scrums, you know. Anyhow, that's my background. So uh, just out of curiosity, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, are you, uh, were you in any way involved in the Sentinel project? Not, not directly. Uh, the way I came uh, involved uh, in the Sentinel project was because I trained some of the people in Washington, D.C. I've been running these Scrum classes for the last seven years or so, and I almost do a one, one every month or one every two month class in D.C. Mm. And some of the Sentinel people were in my class. In fact, I don't remember the names of hand, but uh, they were in my class a few, a few times here. Mm, cool. So, um, I, I, thank you very much for the, the background there. I think uh, I think I learned quite a bit about you, actually. Um, so, do you remember? I guess it was probably in 2001 itself. You got a phone call or an email uh, inviting you to the event. Do you remember who who sent you that email and what the context of the invitation was? Sure. I uh, it was an email by Robert Martin. Mm. Robert Martin and Martin Fowler apparently had uh, this bright idea to write a write a manifesto, start a revolution, and change the world. <laughs> and, so, and, and I I m- might be able to find that email somewhere in my archives. But basically said that you know might you want to come along to join us in a mountain or wherever you know an island I think was the the original idea. Write a manifesto and change the world. And then uh, it's kind of a funny story because I thought, you know, what a bunch of crazy people. Yeah, I'll join them, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so I knew Robert from the conferences. He and I were good friends. And uh, he's also from Chicago. He actually lives not too far from me, maybe three or four miles away from me. Oh, wow. So uh, he was, as I was, we were very upset because we would say projects. And after we would say the projects, the clients would fire us. And they say, you know, thank you for your hard work. We'll call you when we have another emergency, you know. Yeah. And so it was, uh, it, was, um, it was distressing just because they, they kept going back to the stuff that didn't work, you know. Yeah. We actually, we spoke with Bob, James and I did, right? And um, it was about two weeks ago. And I, I, I've never laughed so hard through a technical interview in my entire life. It was amazing. He's a great person. He's a great guy. He is a great guy. <laughs> yeah, I feel like as, as, as much as I feel like I bother him now, I'd bother him more if I lived two or three miles away from him. I, I have lunch with him every now and then, and he's a, he's a very funny person. Uh, I, I, just like you said, he's just a great guy to hang around. Yeah. And, uh, extremely bright, of course. You know. So your gateway into the, um, the invitation, I'm assuming, but I, I think it's an educated assumption, was the early work you were doing with Sutherland and, and Schwaber with the, with the Scrum framework? 
Sure, sure. I mean, I was invited because I started doing, I was the second person that implemented Scrum after Jeff. Mm. So as far as I know, Martin, Martin the boss in, mm. uh, from Belgium and I were the second people that, you know, I, was, I started in mid-1995 when they were still working on the Uppsala paper. And I based a lot of the stuff with uh, emails to Jeff or emails to Ken. And, so, and then we wrote what, the, what we call now the, organi- uh, the, the Scrum Patterns uh, article, which was the, se- the second published paper on Scrum. The first one, of course, was the Uppsala 95 uh, yeah. paper. And then ours was the second one, which was the, the Scrum Patterns uh, article. You know. But yeah, I, I, I had been doing Scrum for five years. I was very vocal in the news groups and the conferences. You know, in fact, I, I was the only, back then I was the only organizer at any conference, you know, re- related to Scrum. So, so yeah, we knew each other very well. So what was your, how did you get connected with the Scrum guys, with Jeff and with, um, uh, uh, my brain just went blank, Ken. How did you get well, uh, I was, I was an object person. And so Jeff was an object person. So I used to attend his business object workshops. Mm. And so he started doing these business objects workshops in early 90s, you know, 93, 94, 95. So I was part of that workshop and I knew Jeff from those workshops. And uh, so one, one day, literally one day uh, in, in early 1995 or so, I get an email that says, Mike, you should try this thing I call invented called Scrum. I, I have measured up to 600% productivity improvements. And to be honest with you, I was like, you know, you know, he must be joking or he, he lost his mind or something. I mean, you know, to make such a claim was uh, outrageous, right? right. But, the, but then I knew, I knew Jeff. I knew he had a lot of credibility. I, I had met him personally at the conferences. And moreover, I knew that um, his office was co-located at the MIT and then that's literally where he invented Scrum at a seminar in the so-called subsumption architecture, you know. So, uh, so, so, yeah, I met him through the object technology community. That's awesome. So let's, um, let, let's set our mental context here to Snowbird 2001. Um, as I understand it, you guys basically had a, an informal gathering the evening before the first planned day. Um, if you could just put your mind into the, the earliest memory you have about that, that two day event, be it the night before or the first morning, can you describe what you were seeing, what you were sensing, what you were feeling as you started making the connections with these guys and you started hearing why they were drawn to the event and um, just help paint the, um, the verbal picture of, of what it was like to make those early connections in Snowbird. Sure. So I was my first impression. It it was uh, it was a sunny day in Salt Lake City, uh, and I can't remember the exact temperature, but it was you know mild temperature. Uh, we started going up the canyon, and literally after one turn up the canyon, everything was snowed out. You know, hmm. so my my first impression is like I'm in some kind of a, a, you know universe warp universe where you may you make a sharp turn and all of a sudden there's snow. You know. I mean, mm-hmm. like, a, like a sunny, you know, warm day, you know, for, for someone in Chicago in the 50s, and then you make a turn and it's 32 with snow, you know. And so uh, I was going up in, a, in one of these little buses that takes you over the resorts, and I was thinking to myself, I don't know if this is a, you know, this is a complete waste of time uh, or, you know, what will happen. There was a little bit of uncertainty, if you will, thinking, uh, you know, yeah, right, we're going to write a manifesto and change the world. Let's see how that works. But, mm-hmm. I mean... There was a, certainly a lot of uh, skepticism from my side, thinking, you know, I'm, I'm here, you know, but I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yeah. So when you guys all start connecting for the first time, um, I'm assuming, well, you knew, you knew Jeff, you knew Ken. How many of the others were you uh, familiar with? Or I guess the inverse question is what I'm asking. Who, who didn't you know? Who, was the, who were the first? Uh, interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, I knew Ken, Ken Beck uh, in Ward from the plop conferences. Right. Uh, and I knew, um, and I knew them well because I had interacted with them in quite a, I mean, I've been interacting with them for maybe five years. I knew Ken and Jeff because I had seen them before and, and you know, uh, Ken and I were already planning to write this, uh, this book, you know, in, um, 
in, 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 or actually we were just talking, we were just talking about writing the book then when we went on the mountain. I, the other two guys uh, from XP, you know, James Groening and Ron Jeffries, I have never met them in person, but I have interacted with them, you know, through the XP, Extreme Programming mailing list. The other guys, I didn't know that much. I didn't know John Kern. I did not know, uh, you know, uh, any of the other guys uh, from the Pragmatic, you know, uh, Dave mm. Thomas and, and so forth. And um, were you... I knew, well, Alistair, I knew Alistair also from the... From the uh, from the plot conferences, the plot conferences are of course part and launch of programming uh, conferences. Yeah, and so you obviously had familiarity with Scrum and XP since you knew Alistair. I imagine you had some awareness to Crystal. You know, to be honest with you, I have heard from it, <laughs> and I guess you know I will say this in front of Alistair. Mm. There were so few instances of Crystal. You know, I mean, in fact, I think there was four flavors of Crystal. And one of these, one of these uh, flavors had only one instance, you know. Mm. So there was one, one group that was doing uh, Crystal Clear, I believe, you know. Anyhow, I, I did know him. Uh, he was uh, certainly a personality already in the use cases and patterns, uh, you know, uh, communities. But uh, not from Crystal, not so much from Crystal, from the pattern community. Did you know anything of DSDM that brought Ari there? No, I did not. I did not know Ari, and in fact, I did not know much about DSDM or FDD. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I did not know much about that. Cool. So I, I was told that um, Martin, being the, the great facilitator that he naturally is, was the one that I think first tried to harness the conversation. Um, you have 17 type A engineering and scientific based people, you're going to have a lot of opinions going through that room. And yeah, yeah. if I, rem- if the story was told to me correctly and I've heard it from at least three people now, so I'm thinking there's some sense of truth to this. Um, Martin kind of got people together and said, Hey, let, let's just get out some index cards, jot down what it is that we're passionate about or what it is that we, we look to accomplish here. It's either a word or a phrase and we'll just throw it into the middle of the room. Do you, does this, um, just yeah, that sounds familiar. That sounds familiar. Uh, that's what we did, and uh, Martin is the one that uh, you know. They, they the joke was that thank thank God for the XP guys because they brought the index cards into the room. Otherwise, you know, it would have been a lot harder to get to do anything. You know, God, it feels like I'm interviewing Alistair all over again because he said <laughs> the exact same thing. <laughs> he, well, I think actually Alistair had his he had his flavor to it where he said. Those damn XP guys must have come together and decided we're going to do this because they all had the, the index cards. Exactly. So in that, in that really was uh, a, uh, a good contribution. It sounds, sounds uh, you know, trivial, right? Mm-hmm. But it really was uh, an important contribution that they had the cards with them, you know. Yeah, and what I understand, the, the way the story goes was that after throwing enough cards in the center that you have a pretty good population, you all went through and did an affinity mapping so that like and similar ideas got grouped into different themes or different, different piles. Correct. Um, correct. From there, you basically created a self-forming agenda. Exactly. So it was, it was a little bit felt like now a little bit of modern open space, you know, I'm not sure if it was conscious <laughs> or I miss the, the fact that it was conscious, but it felt like if you go to one of these uh, modern agile conferences, it felt a little bit like a modern uh, open space, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I'm not sure that was delivered. Yeah, no, but it worked. And, you know, obviously jumping ahead a little bit, the outcome was pretty significant. So it, it damn sure worked. Sure. <laughs> um, if you could think back and um, I'm going to ask this in the context of you as Mike Beetle. I, do you remember anything that you wrote on any of the index cards? I believe there are some flip charts on the floor as well that you guys were filling in. But do you remember anything that you wrote that you were passionate about? Not that it was your idea that got into the manifesto, but just something that brought you there. You know, to be honest with you, offhand, I don't, you know, I don't remember um, anything that I, uh, that I wrote on those cards. No. It's incredible, man. Like you guys are very consistent in that piece. <laughs> I, mean, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, thinking hard and going by memory, and I just don't remember, you know, I yeah. just don't remember anything that I, that I wrote down. You know. no, that's fair, and, I, and it's, it's, it's actually 
kind of amazing. One of the things that we're trying to understand is who brought what to the table. Sure. And it seems like that's one of the mysteries that will go unresolved because you guys are all very protective of the fact that there was no individual contribution here. You guys as a collective came forward with these ideas. Yeah, at least the, the, all of the ideas, I can tell you that on the second day, the person that became the scribe, if you will, was Ken Beck, you know, Mm. Uh, Ken, Ken Beck started writing something like, so we believe in this and then we would say yes, but you know, but we don't believe in this other stuff so much and so forth. But I mean, he was the, he was the guy writing the stuff on the board, you know? Yeah. And I heard some amazing stories about the way that the word agile came to be, right? There was, um, there was an ex- an activity where you went through and determined, well, I think everyone wrote down what names they wanted. And then you went through a, um, a reduction exercise where you, you, you took out the ones that you could not live with. And then it wasn't that anyone was really strongly saying, yes, agile is the term. It was just the one that everybody agreed they could live with. Is it? It is true. I mean, I can tell you, I came up with that word. That's, that's the one thing I remember. I came up with that word because I was familiar with the book, um, uh, you know, uh, from, um, Goldman and, um, which, which is the author? The other author is uh, Ron Goldman. Is Agile uh, company? Let you see. It was uh, Ron Gold. No, no, not Ron Goldman. Um, if I remember the title, I'm looking out on Google right now, but I, I'm coming up empty here. Agile competitors and virtual organizations. Okay. That's what it is. Agile competitors and virtual organizations. See, I was at IBM when our manager brought this stuff. Uh, IBM became part of the so-called Agile Consortium, and uh, they brought this stuff about, you know, after the bankruptcy of Chrysler, uh, the U.S. was really afraid that we would lose competitive advantage towards uh, Japan, China, and in, in, uh, Germany, and uh, given that the, one of their largest manufacturers was, was bankrupt. And so... Uh, we had we had proposed. I have here actually in some of my notes from that day. We had proposed adaptive, essential, lean, lightweight, and so adaptive. Uh, we did not want to give that name because uh, Jim Heisman had given that name to one of his works. You know, mm-hmm. uh, essential sounded too uh, kind of corny, kind of thing. You know, or maybe you know overly, uh, you know proud or something right. uh, lean had already been taken nobody wanted to be a lightweight uh, i remember when i when we finally decided i mean i casually suggest not don't, don't think that i had this planned or anything you know yeah. i casually suggested to use the the word agile and i remember uh martin fowler said uh well mike the only problem is if we use agile we're going to be successful you know and everybody laughed and we went with that you know nice. but it was it was not really if you will a we were doing this late in the second day, and it took us maybe a, a few minutes just to decide on this. You know, so it yeah. wasn't really even that part of the thinking. You know, do you remember any of the things that did not go so quickly? Something that might have had either a higher level of disagreement or needed some more verbal coaxing to get through. You know, the 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 one thing that stuck to my mind because I was a little bit frustrated, at, you know, in maybe even mid through the second day, it was that we had a hard time. We had sort of like a writer's block, you know. Mm. You know we were not able to write anything down for almost a day and a half. Nothing was written down in terms of my. It were just like very loose ideas, you know. Mm-hmm. And so more, more ideas like we, we like this and we like that and we, li- you know, but it was nothing concrete about a manifest or something, you know? And so that was, that was maybe the one thing, I mean, at the end of the second day and that's after four o'clock on the second day, things started to pick up. Was there a tipping point? Was there something that happened that broke the writing block? Well, I think, I think the fact that Kent, Kent Beck, we were still arguing and, you know, talking back and forth. And uh, he approached the whiteboard and he started writing stuff down, you know. Mm. And so uh, I, I thought that was significant. That right. was significant because that broke the writer's block. And so we, you know, he would write and we would 
basically come around him and give him, well, no, 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 you know, it's not that we don't like these things, it's yeah. that we only prefer to do these things and so forth, you know. Yeah, the, the idea of the double positive statement is amazing, um, the this over that. It's not that we dis- disagree with the second part of the sentence, it's just we prefer the, the first part, right? Exactly, exactly. And I, and I think that's what some people still today have a hard time understanding. It's really not that we hate documents or hate processes. You know, I mean, Scrum has a, a backlog, which is the, technically a document. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a process, you know, which has, you know, the, the you know, planning, execution, review, retrospective refinements, and things like that. But we prefer other things, of course, you know. And so that is really the thing that still... It's not, we're not going to throw the, completely the old world. We're just we're just going to say that these things are more important than other things. You know? Yeah, that's great. Um, so still at the event, um, the way I understood the day was structured is you had three sessions. You had um, morning, afternoon, and evening, and then in between there was some downtime. Yeah, yeah. There was, uh, which I think is a great idea. I mean. You're doing some heavy knowledge working, so you probably need some time to retreat and just do some mental hygiene. Um, we got some. We need some time to ski. Well, that's the question I'm going for here. There was there was three three or four main things I heard happened at these breaks. It was either skiing, hot tubbing, uh, the lounge, so getting some drinks, yeah. or going back to your room and writing. Right, right. I think All you already tipped your hat. You went skiing. Well, I was skiing uh, one time, and I, you know, to be honest with you, I, I remember skiing either on the, I can't remember if it was the first day or the second. I did one skiing and maybe just one hanging out session, you know. Hmm. But uh, I, I think they went skiing a second time, and I didn't go for whatever reason. You know? Yeah. How are you as a skier? I'm okay, you know. I, I remember one incident, which we're skiing together with uh, James Graining and uh, Jim Highsmith. Mm. We're up somewhere in the mountain, and, you know, I, I would ski the blues and the blacks with them sometimes. And then all of a sudden, Jim Highsmith looks at me, and he says, Mike, don't follow me or don't follow us. And he he, he goes down this carvass, you know, and, uh, and I'm like, I'm just looking at him, and I say, well... <laughs> I was not even thinking of doing that, you know. I mean, literally, he's he's going down a slope that looked to me like uh, 70 degrees, you know. I mean, it was, I don't know how they did it. See, I, 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 I lost him after that, you know. There's many, there's many um, non-parallels in our lives, and, and this is one more. When, my wife is a, a world-class skier, mm-hmm. and when I go skiing with her, she says, follow me, as she goes down the double blacks, hoping <laughs> to <laughs> So, um, and by the way, I am not a, I am not a world-class skier. <laughs> I'm yeah, not- I mean, I'm, I'm okay. I'm an okay skier, but no, I'm not, I'm not as good as James or James. James looked at him after he said that, and he just went down the, you know, down the carbass, and I was just staring at him like, you know, I mean, I, I would die if I go down that way. Yeah. Well, thank God they lived so you could finish off the project. Otherwise, we might not have uh, had the manifesto at the end. <laughs> So uh, coming out of the event, um, I understand you guys had the, the four value statements um, and then you worked on the principles via email after. Yeah. Um, what, I mean, obviously the industry took off and we kind of look back to the Agile Manifesto as one of the, um, the catalysts to the Agile movement, right? That's, that's the, the t- that was kind of, without using the same term again, but the tipping point for a lot of things that got sent in motion. The, yeah. bold, the bold question I have is, did you foresee the aftermath as it actually turned out to be? Like, what was that your, did you have any inkling of an expectation that this whole industry that we have now was going to come from that, that event in Snower? No way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no way. I mean, I can tell you when I was coming down in the boss, <laughs> when I was coming down on the bus from Snowbird, mm. I was thinking to myself, I, I only hope that a few people go, let's see what happens if a few people go to the website, you know. Mm. But, you know, I mean, we, our hope was that a few hundred people will go see the website. What, what has happened today? Someone sent me today an article about uh, some the f- people in psychology are doing now things with Agile, you know. Oh, I've there's, heard of, uh, yeah. There's all sorts of things about, you know, and, and you, probably see, you probably will see a lot more in that group. 
there's agile sales, there's agile marketing, there's agile leadership, there's agile. I mean, it's getting out of control. You know, I mean, it, it's really. I mean, I, I, no, no, I, ne I never foresaw all of this stuff. Mike, I don't know if you've heard this one yet, but there's there's agile marriage counseling. I did not, but I will remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> so in that, I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it is just getting out of control. I mean, I I know of people doing. Agile for managing churches, you know, that, that's, uh, for example, Jeff Sutherland's wife, uh, which used to be a pastor at a church. Mm. And there's, uh, I mean, all sorts of things like that, which is, you know, agile databases, agile finance, agile budgeting, agile, you know, HR. Oh, and all of these things are pretty hot. I mean, they're, they're almost like multi-billion dollar industries, you know. I mean, but why do you think that is? Why do you think there's such a, a hunger for agile to be applied outside of IT like that? Because, and I, I, I take a, a couple of minutes in my class to explain this, because the, the rate of change in the world has increased so much that basically all of our management techniques for strategy, for marketing, for sales, for HR, everything, for innovation, right? Everything has changed because we live in a different world. The 21st century, it's almost, it's almost like it's, it's a coincidence that we wrote it so close to the millennia because... I mean, the 21st century calls for a world of rapid change. And yeah. if you, you cannot manage anything, not, not software development or not hardware development or not compliance, HR, marketing, with the traditional management methods that we have. I mean, this is a new wave of management techniques that comes uh, together, you know, uh, Scrum in the Agile, if you will, are what ties the, 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 the bigger picture. But then you have a lean startup, you have blue ocean strategy, you have uh, business model generation, you have exponential organizations. I mean, all of this stuff beyond budgeting, all of this stuff adds, adds to what we had before as management techniques. Literally, you pay an arm and a leg to get an MBA and uh, just to learn techniques that are outdated by 30, 40 years. I love that. I love that statement right there. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so... I guess it's another bold or broad, broad stroke of a question here, but what are your thoughts on the state of Agile over the last 15 years? Are there, there are aspects of it that you think the industry got right and other areas that were straying off the path? Well, uh, that's a great question, and I will answer it in two parts. You know, uh, The part, the concepts themselves, I think still stand the test of time. Not that, not that they shouldn't be evolved, you know, I, I will tell you, I will be very glad to see uh, the next evolutionary step, if you will, in the works. You know, uh, I think there's contributions from very many different areas. I think the conceptual part is still works. What is disappointing sometimes, and, you know, and again, that's, that comes with understanding that the, the implementations go through cycles of improvement. And because so many people is their first go and they, they maybe just have misunderstandings or they're doing it on the cheap. There's mm -hmm. a lot of bad agile and a lot of bad scrum. Uh, when, when I see that and then in the problem, then is criticizing the agile and scrum, not criticizing the implementations. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of gripe, if you will, on why agile and scrum are not working. People are ready to toss them out the door. And when they don't really have a, a new alternative, but it's, it's fashionable in this day and age to just come up with something, slap a, slap a label and just say, well, let's now do blah, blah, blah. And it turns out to be almost the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if, if you've seen this before, but it's kind of a weird perversion of Scrum where some people take Scrum and try to rigidly install it. And in doing so, they actually remove the agility from Scrum. Have you? Right. How do you feel? I mean, have you seen this? Have you experienced this? And all the time, all the time. So, in the, in this is you know it goes with a long explanation, right? But this is why Scrum is a framework. Framework is not supposed to be something rigid. When people say we're installing the Scrum process, hopefully not, because Scrum is not a uh, you know, a, a, a fully defined things. You know, when you implement Scrum, you're supposed to fill in the gaps with the solutions that make sense for you. In other words, there should not be any two Scrum implementations that are done the same way. People should implement Scrum basically just the framework and 
fill in the gaps with what they need to do in context, you know. Yeah. And, well, this is a problem that we have. People want canned solutions, you know, and people want people essentially want to have just an execution plan, but it's not that easy. If you really understand the agile ideas, it's all about understanding what makes sense in context, you know. Yeah, and, I like to I like to frame the conversation around um, principles and practices, right? The practices are meant to just help get you toward the principles. The principles themselves never really change. They, they stay relatively stable. Exactly, exactly. And so the, the problem that we have is we have, we have one too many people stuck in basically in what, they, in what they used to know, which in other words, you, even you look at the startup uh, community, which, you know, uh, I'm... I'm uh, I'm, I'm, you know, fairly interacting, you know, interacting with them all the time. And same problem in the startup community. We used to have the concept of a business plan and you just have to execute the business plan. Well, it doesn't work like that. It's the same as development. It's the same as a transformation. It's the same as, you know, growing a company. It's all about finding out what you don't know, you know. In, 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 the, in the 20th century, just because we knew we could make, you know, things didn't change that much, so we could play, we could make longer plan in longer time horizons. In the 21st century, things change so much, but, you know, you, you can make a plan, but you have to be ready to toss that plan and modify it and, and, uh, and adapt as you go, you know. And so that's, that's what I see, for example, and it's frustrating for trans- agile, so-called agile transformations. I have literally seen a Gantt chart on how to install Scrum, you know, mm. uh, or, or, you know, just like you said, you know, people take Scrum and they want to install it, uh, you know, out of the box with no changes. In it. Are you, you're the, oh, please don't let me be wrong here, but I believe you actually champion the idea of using Scrum to run the transformation. Is that, am well, I right? I, uh, I, 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 I've been championing that for the last 16 years or so. And I can tell you, you reach very similar conclusions. Everyone that has been involved in a successful transformation, you need to know you have to adapt the transformation as you go. So, yes, I, I have, you know, and uh, there's a few other people, of course, that eventually reach the same conclusions, you know. But uh, I don't see how people just do it literally with a Gantt chart, you know. I mean, it's, it's just not possible. Yeah. And based on the, what you were saying about the um – the, the rapid ideation of the business plan in the startup community. Is it safe to assume you're a fan of Ash Moira and the, uh, the lean canvas and that whole? Absolutely. absolutely. In fact, uh, in the, in, in the enterprise Scrum book, which I'm uh, finishing as, as we speak right now, I have what we call the enterprise Scrum business model canvas. I also have a way to create canvases based on enterprise Scrum. you know, so, so you have, for example, compliance management, you have, marketing, you have startup management, uh, you have agile, agile software development. What do these things have in mind? They evolve models over time. You know, you look at the business model canvas, it evolves, we evolve in the cost, revenue, partners, uh, customers, value propositions. Yeah. You know, and, and so you have a, a business model canvas that evolves in time and that's how you manage your startup, you know. But I mean, th- this, is, this is a very interesting area to me just because it's really managing things in general, you know. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. I have this strange love hate uh, relationship with the startup industry. Um, and, and the hate generally come and hate's a really strong word, but you know, it fits the paradigm here. Um, the idea that success is driven by the amount of venture capital investment that you get. It just, it, it bothers me. It bothers me to my core. Um, mm-hmm. And I think uh, as, as ideas like the ones you're purporting where, or you're um, pushing for where we're coming up with ways to capture value as rapidly as possible. And value is actually people invest, like actual customers consuming our product is, is, is really what I believe the heart of the startup should be. So, so much. Yeah, I, mean, I disagree with you and, and you, and you probably know this because you quoted, for example, Lash Maura, uh, mm. Steve, I'm a fan of Steve Blank. You know, I think Steve yep. Blank uh, is the, is the person that, you know, so so if you read Steve Blank and you come back to the strong community, and you know, then you would ask, so how do we? And, and you read uh, Alex Asterwalder's uh, business model generation, right? So how how do we take a startup and evolve it? You know, instead of having this stupid idea about a you know business plan that we're executing, right? 
And, and you see so much cash wait, so much cash wasted on that because they, they don't adapt stuff as they go. Uh, Lean Star was a great step in the right direction. Lean Star doesn't tell you how to build the, the MVPs, if you will. So you can, you can build them with Scrum. And internally, if you will, the, the emergent behavior behind a Lean Star will be Scrum behind the scenes. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you have the guys like Jeff Goldfelf with the, the the whole Lean series, right? So Ashes in the Lean series, you have the Eric Reese book, you have Jeff Goldfelf. The idea of taking those ideas that are, that, you know, were cemented in the startup movement and actually bringing those into the large enterprise and start doing the entrepreneurship uh, work is, is quite awesome. And you, again, you can leverage Scrum with great success to do that. So absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned enterprise Scrum uh, a few minutes ago. Um, for anyone that's not familiar first, can you just give a, a quick, you know, 30 minute elevator pitch and just let people know where they can learn more? Because I think it's a little bit more than we can unpack in the time remaining here. Sure, no problem. So Enterprise Scrum is making Scrum gen- generic enough so that people can do it in any domain. So that's the, the high-level elevator pitch, if you will, you know. And so you can say, well, you know, it, it, it is really easy, but it gets, it gets more complex when you actually do it in the, in the trenches, right? So you have a lot of parameters that change. You know, are you doing, for example, what's the definition of done for, you know, a business goal? Uh, what type of activities do you have in the executive board instead of the development, you know, environment? So you you may be talking about instead of the, the so-called uh, product backlog item, uh, we gave it some other names so that uh, it's easier for people to, to, to work with them. You know, if you ask someone in compliance to do a product backlog, they'll tell you, I'm not building any products. And so we gave this name called the value list to the product backlog. Mm-hmm. I recently, two weeks ago, I went to talk to Jeff and his team at Coming and presented the whole enterprise framework to them. They actually liked it a lot. And to be honest with you, that was for me a, uh, a very, very important step. Just because uh, if Jeff and his team, which are some of the best Scrum people on the planet, like it, it probably means that everybody will have a, you know, a, a positive, uh, you know, a feel about it, you know. It definitely shows that you're onto something, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I can tell you, when I share some of these ideas with uh, some, of the, some of the best coaches on the planet, they tell me, Mike, we do this stuff. We do, for example, I'll, I'll give you one. So when you do Scrum for executive management, most of the work that you do is making decisions. So your product backlog or your value list, as we call it in enterprise Scrum, is really decisions to be made. There's, there's really little work to be done like we do in development or so. Uh, and, and there's things like that. There's, there's, I have people doing portfolio management, for example, for mutual funds. Mm. And what they do is they don't do any work, but they monitor the trades. They, they monitor the stuff on the portfolio. You know? so there's, they're, they're in, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is uh, there's ways to parameterize what we do in Scrum so that it feels uh, it fits into general management, and that's basically what Enterprise Scrum. Enterprise Scrum has different names, uh, pretty much the same roles, and about eighty parameters to customize Scrum so you can fit it to manage anything. And it's EnterpriseScrum.com with the um, with the Enterprise Scrum book coming out in 2017. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, uh, the Mike Cohn Signature Series books. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, I, I wish you great success with that. I, I will be pre-ordering that and look forward to getting my hands on it. Well, thanks. I mean, I can tell you, Scrum is not the only way to do this. And, and to be honest with you, I'm piggybacking, if you will, into having so many Scrum people in the world. There's other ways of doing this thing. You can easily come up with another, another agile method, if you will. But since Scrum is my thing and I, I seen it on the field and I coach people with Scrum, so that's, that's why I went with Enterprise Scrum and not with something like uh, business agility or something like that. Cool. So I have, I have two remaining questions, Mike. Um, my first one is, are there any regrets? Is there anything that came from either the Agile Manifesto or it, within the industry in the last 10 or 15 years that you look back at and you're like, I kind of wish that that never came to be? Not really, to be honest with you. I, uh, I'm, I'm more on the positive side. I think uh, even even the criticisms, you know, 
are positive. You know, if uh, I think it's, it's important for people to air out even criticisms. So there's nothing, nothing in that regards. I think everything has been, at least in my in my view, fairly positive. You know. So then, grabbing on the, the second question was the positive question. I never like leaving on the negative. Um, yeah. What is the if you could talk to the next generation of agile practitioners and say the one thing that you want them to understand or to grab hold of and really take to the next level in the world of agile, what, what would that thing be or what advice would you give to this, this next generation? So I would tell them, take this as a, you know, take the agile ideas in as a, as a good starting point, uh, a starting point that maybe get you further than what we had as management in the 20th century. Mm. But, don't stop looking. Keep innovating. Even, in fact, keep questioning the techniques and uh, keep questioning what's the better way, you know. I mean, the only way to evolve eventually is to piggyback and stand, quote-unquote, stand in the, in the shoulders of giants, right? Mm. So don't, don't be afraid to take it down. If you do find good reasons to evolve it, to improve it, go ahead, right? Uh, and so don't, you know, don't stop. Don't stop here. Go, go f- take it to take it further, you know. It's beautiful. Thank you, Mike. Is there any um, any plugs that you want to put in to drive people to either Enterprise Scrum, your Twitter, your, your LinkedIn, or anything? Uh, well, I have, yeah, I do have uh, maybe just the Twitter account if you have that. It's just twitter.com, and then it's Mike Beal after that, you know. Sure, we'll make sure we get that in the show notes. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, James, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, I mean, ultimately, Mike, I think covered pretty much everything I was going to ask him, ironically, in, um, in his discussion on Enterprise Scrum is, and that's, I've been really focused on teaching um, at the current engagement I'm on. I've been spending a lot of time teaching business areas how to, how to do Scrum. I mean, I'm working with uh, the internal audit group right now uh, mm-hmm. here at uh, the client I'm at, so Everything that he was saying with Enterprise Scrum just, I mean, it, it literally covered the gamut of the questions that I really wanted to ask. And, you know, he is, you know, with your work, Mike, you're, you're definitely taking Agile outside of IT. And, you know, we've seen a lot of success with the, you know, internal audit groups uh, that we're doing as well as some of the direct mail communications that we're doing with our client or with our customer base at this, at this current client. So, you know, it's, yeah, I think our biggest challenge has always been uh, and it's getting, it, it, we, we've had, a, we've, you know, the thing that we struggle with most is, is actually mapping terminologies, bringing that, that domain specific terminologies into, you know, this piece of it. So to hear that you kind of, you know, that you've started to come up with some intelligent names that span across domains, I think that's going to, you know, really help take, you know, these agile principles into to IT, so so thank you for that, and I am definitely looking forward to the book coming out. Absolutely, I can send you guys a link. I have an article as an introduction in uh, Medium.com, mm-hmm. and I can send you uh, that to you guys uh, if you want to take a look at that. Just see it has all of the names uh, in it, you know. Yeah, I'll make sure we get that tweeted out for you, and we'll add that to the show description as well. Absolutely, and so. Uh, so I, I want to thank you uh, before we go to you guys. You know, I think you guys uh, are doing, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, uh, you know, the, the some of us that are in the trenches, we're just busy. You're we're just too busy to stop and ask these questions, you know. But I think it's useful for the community to to sort of retrospect into what happened and to, and to you know, point out maybe to the future. I'm actually looking forward to read all of the other stuff from the other from the other co-authors yep. and uh, compare notes, if you will. And so do send me a link when you publish this stuff. I, I would like to take a look at it. Uh, and mm-hmm. so I think you're, uh, it, this really serves a purpose, I think, for everyone to bring more understanding, you know. Thank you very much, Mike. And that's exactly what we're after. So I will make sure I get you a link that's on agileuprising.com. We incrementally update the table. So as we talk to the 17 of you, we add links to it. So it's a living, breathing document. We uh, practice what we preach. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you, guys. I know.